Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. And as always, I thank all of you from America and across the world for tuning in to join me this evening as I go through all things esoteric and usually covering the ancient manuscripts and how they tie together the mythological world and the reality of the conspiracy of the New World Order elites in aligning against the masses and the children of Adam um, together with what is the biblical narrative and the underlying truth of that which for those that are true seekers and that want to know about the strange nature of the reality we contend with and the powers, the principalities, the rulers of darkness, it takes really dedication and deep seeking to unlock these mysteries and to have the riddles of these kinds of things brought forth to you. It says in Proverbs that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to seek it out. And truly, that is the way of it. But yet, so many are led astray in this day and age. And certainly, Satan, as the eye atop the Illuminati pyramid, has done an incredible job of orchestrating a matrix of design which separates people, children, families, generations, grandparents, great-grandparents, on and on and on from even seeking out the truth of why we are here and who we are and what all this is really all about. Most get caught up in the carnal aspects of what has been foisted on us as the materialistic dream of gaining and accomplishing success with regard to wealth, materialism, job and title and those kind of things have taken over as the focus the goals and consume the dreams of everybody born into this world that the grand architect Satan the Demiurge Yaldabaoth the uh, again the adversary the eye at the top of the Illuminati pyramid, he has established the fake reality of that that all of us are indoctrinated into as soon as we enter into this world, as soon as we are born of our mothers and come into the world, that even then, the assault to destroy us begins. And the challenges of overcoming 
the viciousness of this world and the odds against us are really insurmountable. So much so that Yeshua said that in the last days, in the end times, unless the days be shortened, there should be no flesh left. And really, now the assault on the innocence, the degradation, the genetic corruption begins as soon as we enter the world. The vaccines that are injected into most children, the poisons that are flooded into our systems via not just the vaccines, but the toxicity carried in the air and the water and the food, that it begins to diminish our capacity immediately, the fluoride in the water, the chemtrails in the air. And so it's amazing that any child could survive to really even come to understanding or even come to the capacity to question the relevancy of those things that all of us have been taught as truth and as what is real. And the deception is so vast, so all-encompassing that even what we think of the cosmology and the earth and the place that we are as humans born into this world and as a, a fallen being in a fallen world, we have no idea as to really how it all began and why it is the way that it is. And what even precedes the last 6,000 years of modern history, that there certainly was a time in our ancient past which most cannot even conceptualize and cannot even incorporate into their understanding of the story of humanity and the roots of who we are, how we got here, all these things. And whereas most people believe the Bible to be all fairy tale, fantasy, and just mythology, it, for those that really seek out and try to understand the scriptures as given to us by the Most High God, the Creator, that established us, created us, and placed us here, and built this incredible home, built the earth as our incredible home. The riddles of all of those things, the larger questions of our being and our reasons for being here really do come to light in a way that can profoundly shift in remembrance who we are. Because the memories are encoded. They are burned to soul for those that can access them and that can in touching upon them and getting a glimpse of knowing these kind of things can begin to make sense. And so the journey to awakening is difficult and overwhelmingly challenging. And yet it is the journey 
the destination, the path that really all of us must take into in order to make it home. But yet again, because Satan and the powers, the principalities, the rulers of darkness, wickedness in high places, they have deceived us so entirely, most never even begin to make that journey. The most never even seek out the path to awakening and become ambivalent, complacent, and totally okay with not knowing. Most are callous to the larger questions of who we are. Have no concern at all for truth or for making sense of world. And I know that the distractions are enormous, that Satan, as it says in the protocols, that they would use amusements, distractions, entertainments to compel us to seek out pleasure and to indulge in such so much that that becomes the focus, the dominating factor of our lives. And for most, that is, whether it's sexual or through drugs or whatever it may be, that seeking out pleasure and overwhelming one's senses with delight that that has become the the focus of most people's lives. And yet, again, the whole world of carnality and the sensual, the sensory pleasures of this world have been utilized by Satan in order to not only to cause our fall and to cause humanity to come under the authority of death, but it has also been the, the desire of even the angels to indulge in carnality and to seek out kingdoms to rule over for themselves so that they can, in ruling over those kingdoms with impunity, to indulge in sensual pleasures. And that it was even the reason for the fallen ones to be caught up in the flesh and to lose their first estate and to be exiled, bound here to the earth, and themselves also to be placed under the authority of death, that they gave up their immortality, their bright nature, in order to have chance to crave and fulfill the cravings of their sensual pursuits. And the same thing that caused them to fall was the same thing that led Eve to be beguiled by the serpent and Adam to fall with her. And we, as race of humans, we have all been subjected to the same banishment that the fallen ones 
had pronounced that sentence upon them so very long ago. The only difference is that we have chance for redemption, that through our Savior Messiah, through Christ, in coming into the flesh and living a sinless life and defeating death, he showed us the way home, and he gave chance to those that born into this flesh world would not succumb so much that they would cause judgment to be brought upon them in such way that they could not be redeemed through Yeshua. And so we are blessed and fortunate that the Most High God loving us in such greatness sent his only begotten Son to enter into flesh and to live in this world in order to overcome the pow powers that be. And in doing so, he's given us all opportunity for salvation through him. And even though this story seems to be, um, it seems to be something that you know, a lot of people will say that, oh, it's just uh, the Christians, they made up all these stories, or the the God of the Old Testament, because there's a, a, another grand deception that is going on, and that's the so-called Gnostic teaching that the Demiurge, Yaldabaoth, that he is the God of the Old Testament. And that these stories contained in the Bible are all deceit. And see, Satan has instilled into the minds of this world this plausibility in order to lead again so many astray and to cause us as the children of God, the sons of God, to fall with him, to be banished with him, and to be exiled, annihilated forevermore with him. He knows that his time is almost up. And so the agenda for deception has been accelerated so much so that the strong delusion of the strong delusion of what is real and what isn't has become the dominating force in everybody's lives so much so that we either figure out the riddle and make sense of all things in profound manner, or we end up losing the game. And losing the game and being deceived by the matrix of delusion parading itself as reality is such that we forevermore lose our bright nature and our original immortal state of being and that we are condemned along with those forces that decided to side with and rebel with Satan the adversary, the fallen chair of Lucifer. 
And this is why it's so very important to understand the story of who we are and why we are here and why it is that I have dedicated my life to servicing the kingdom. And I have dedicated sharing the ancient manuscripts which reveal these truths to people. And while I recognize that most simply will not have concern for these kind of truths simply because they have a bias against or are um, haters of Christianity, believing it to be a faith that was propagated in order to control people, and that even the the judgment of hellfire and damnation, and that there's consequences, repercussions to our actions. People don't like that. People don't like people to control them or to put any kind of slant of you have to do this or you have to be this way or you can't do that. Most rebel against authority and any kind of limitations on what they can or can't do in this world. And so because of that, many people believe that the Bible and the law, the Torah, and those things that are taught within it, that it was put forth again by the adversary, that the whole mechanism of religion and faith was established by the principalities, the wickedness in high places, these rulers of darkness, in order to keep man down or to keep humanity from rising to its potential. When the truth of it is that the law was established by the Creator as a way to control only uh, to keep evil from growing out of hand and to keep people and the angel uh, the angelic hierarchy from dominating and overpowering and overcoming others in the narrow pursuit of self-gratification. That we have the whole thing of service to self or service to others and honor and respect or, you know, um, of getting ahead at the expense of others. And that even the Ten Commandments were established as laws to keep compassion, justice, beauty, and love, and harmony as the overriding theme. And even nature has a natural tendency to to move in such manner and to flow in such manner that even the creation reflects these universal concepts. And yet it is man and the 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 whole divine right of kings you know to to do as thou wilt to do as thou want to do as 
one wishes without any concern for how others feel or how one's actions will play out in another's life. To abuse others. You know, the, the honor your mother, honor your father, uh, honor people, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness. All these different things were established as commandment in order to keep us from harming each other and one another and ourselves in being like, in taking on those ways of being. And that the angels, it was their desire for self-determination with regard to, you know, uh, indulging in evil that caused such destruction and such chaos and such insanity here in this world. And it's the same thing that they are teaching to humanity even now with the television, because that's certainly a mind control mechanism. The media, um, everything, anything that is utilized as medium to influence the masses, whether it's through uh, propaganda such as television shows, movies, anything of that nature, radio broadcasts, uh, books, magazines, that they utilize what we see here, um, all those things to influence our mind and to plant seeds with regard to how they want us to be how they want us to act, and how they want us to treat one another. And because it, again, is one that comes from a place of that is outside of the Torah, that's why we see the chaos reigning in the world. That's why we see even in this day and age the propagation of evil. And what we don't understand is that is there is a bloodline, that there's physical progeny of the devil here, a blood lineage, the seed of Cain, the children of the serpent, the sons of Belial, that are dedicated to indulging themselves in such behavior, but also in compounding it, teaching it, and exposing the world to similar thought and tendency. And it's because of those kinds of actions and those kinds of dominating behavior. I mean, even with, look at all the, you know, the serial murder that we see portrayed on, in TV. Even the different organizations that have been put into place to police, watch over, take care of, and assist those that are in need within society, they portray the abuse of power. Um, these different individuals and organizations utilizing their capacity and their jobs or their reach or their connections to protect themselves and others that they know when they 
do wrong or that they abuse. I mean, it's all over in all of the different shows. And so it's, it's become commonplace. And these kind of things are also taught by the secret societies that have been established by these bloodline elites all over the world in order to bring others into these privileged classes and these privileged uh, these secret societies and the brotherhoods and sisterhoods, the fraternities and sororities of individuals, uh, the connections that are made between them, um, that protecting each other and one another over the concern or care of the masses is first and foremost. And that these kind of connections, you know, um, people that are put into power and that have authority that are utilized by Satan to rule over the masses, they are utilized to slaughter the innocents. I mean, even the fact that, you know, now we have for-profit healthcare institutions which having the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, and yet now we see, because of the for-profit slant, that hospitals would rather lie to parents, lie to families, about the well-being of their loved ones and that they are tricking them at every turn of the way to give up the organs of their loved ones in order to, quote-unquote, you know, do better for others and giving them chance. And yet, you know, hospitals are lying in order to gain access to organs and the whole organ harvestation, uh, which is now rampant all throughout society, even so much that, you know, when you go and get your driver's license, most people get a discount for being an organ donor. And yet they don't at all tell you that what causes the death of an organ donor is them taking their organs from you. That the definitions of brain death or non-heart beating death or persistent vegetative state, these are all false um, diagnoses. That these definitions of quote unquote death are lies which have been instituted into the medical system in order to gain access to living organs and living tissue. Because as soon as real death sets in, organs become corrupted and they are not harvestable and not the hospitals do not have the capacity to sell them. And so this entire organ harvestation trade has been instituted into the for-profit healthcare system so that people every day have their lives at risk when they enter into the care of these facilities and that people every day are being lied to by doctors and nurses and organizations that were supposed to look out for the benefit and to take care of the health of those individuals that come under their services. And yet, as I said, hospitals are lying 
to individuals and to families, creating these fake diagnoses, utilizing drugs to put people into comas, and saying that they're brain dead and they will never wake up from their accidents or that they will be forever persistent in a persistent vegetative state. And yet when they quit administering these drugs to them, they come out just fine. That the comas are delayed and created in order so that families can be tricked. And the whole living will, that a living will most people don't know was created by the right to die groups and that it was a document which protects doctors and hospitals and nurses when they starve and dehydrate you or uh, keep uh, so-called heroic measures which include giving you antibodies or giving you a feeding tube or putting you on a ventilator as needed, which are things that are part of the regular procedure of saving people's lives. And yet most people have no idea that, you know, the living wills basically put you at risk in the same manner that being an organ donor does. And so, as I said, the lies are so pervasive that every turn of the way, your life and that of your families is in danger. All right. Enough of a rant. And so I wanted to share um, some scripture with you and some things from um, a book that we published called The Great Commission. And it's, you know, again, the, the things that were told to the apostles. Um, that when Christ died and ascended up into the heavens, he gave them and appointed them to go out and to share the gospel to all the peoples and to all the corners of the world. And that he said also that when the gospel was shared, and given to all peoples that then the end would come. And so a lot of what we find in the Great Commission, in the work that we have shared, is not only the things that were done by the various prophets and the patriarchs and the apostles in doing such work, but also um, we find in their writings the revelation of the end times as it applies to, in my opinion, those that would be alive at the end of days, which I believe is our generation. And that the reason we see the unfolding of all things and the acceleration of technology and the revelation of truth coming forth in the manner that we do is because we have reached the fig tree generation. And I have shared in teaching this so many times and have shared it in chapter within many of my books and Christ told us multiple times and all the apostles told us multiple times 
as to what the signs of the end of the age would be in that of his second coming. And that it would be with the second advent, with the return of Yeshua, that the harvest would ensue and that the tares that the seed of Cain which the kings and queens and the princess and the princesses and the philanthropers and entrepreneurs and the industrialists and those bankers and those that rule over the control of money those that print the currency and loan it at interest to governments and peoples worldwide that these these groups these people and these families that have for a very long time ruled over that capacity the Ponzi scheme of central banks and the way that they work to subjugate peoples and to burden them with debt, that these groups have for hundreds, if not thousands of years, utilized such control to manipulate the providence of humanity and to dictate the whims of fate and destiny for all people everywhere. And that they are driving us in agenda to what they term as a global domination, even though we know the globe is a false paradigm. The teaching of it is false and just more deception. However, world domination through an international agency which controls the affairs of nations and rulership by them through a world government, the new world order, that that is the driving theme of their efforts for hundreds and even thousands of years that Lucifer, when cast out of the heavens, when iniquity was first found within him, when he declared, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will be above the clouds of God. I will create my seat, my throne of glory in the sides of the north, on the mount of the congregation, in usurping the Godhead of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When he uttered, not even uttered, when he conceived thought in his mind, as to what he desired to do. This was the birth of the New World Order. It was his desire to be like the Most High, which created, engendered the plot for him to succeed in enslaving the masses and into being the ruling authority over all. Even for a short time, even for temporary status, even if it would only be for a few years or one generation, that he succeed in accomplishing his goal, that this has been his desire all along. 
in that even the promises that he made to the other angels which joined him in insurrection they were the they were false they were lies that were garnered in order to gain their support and it's the same manipulation the same lies and the same temporary power control and above the law status that he offers to the new world order the humans which join him and and side with him in his attempts to establish this authority and so this is what really has been the driving force of the what i call the great contest the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness between christ and the devil between the unholy trinity of uh of shemash and baal ashtaroth and horus um that osiris isis and horus you know this unholy trinity of these pagan these fallen angelic deities that they have utilized deception and deceit to control and to manipulate and to lead astray humanity into worshiping them as false gods that all they are are fa fallen angelic beings and yet you know the entire world it says that the dragon that old serpent who deceiveth the entire world that now most mainstream churches most mainstream belief systems are steeped in idolatry and are truly aligned with and giving reverence to the feathered serpent and yet most have no idea as to what they are a part of and that they are involved in cultic behaviors and cultic organizations and you know most organized religions and faiths are deceived and led astray it's individual seekers those that dedicate themselves to the pursuit and the journey of awakening that unlock themselves from matrix and that are led by god the father the son and the holy spirit led into truth and the revelation of it and are then able to break away from what is the indoctrination of the matrix but yet again most people are not committed and not even concerned in any manner with such focus and that's the sad thing but the incredible thing with this day and age and with the access to the internet and being able to type up in a word and to seek out knowledge and to bring forth so much truth as long as you can wade through the disinformation and wade through the lies which are also everywhere leavening the truth and the revelation of it that as long as you have the eyes to see the ears to hear and a mind to understand you can come together with others that have also been awakened by the holy spirit 
that have also been brought to discernment in such a way that they truly are part of the elect, those that are on the narrow path and that are numbered amongst the elect of God, which there are very few. Yeshua said in a text, I will call you one from 1,000, two from 10,000. And so do you see how the elect is but a few, and that most are led astray, whether in ignorance or in arrogance, thinking they know different and better. Most do not have a humble heart to actually like the shepherd or like David and like others that were brought to be utilized as vessels of honor by the Most High God, that it is these kinds of individuals being humble and being foot washers unto humanity and that bending the knee to serve others, it is these kinds of individuals that the Most High utilizes to bring forth in prophecy the truth of his word and the revelation of who he is and how he established the creation. So when we come back from break, we'll get into some of the text. But I, I thought I would just kind of come from the heart this evening that Sometimes I, I don't do shows where I'm really just allowing myself to speak and to flow as spirit leads me. And so I just felt the need to say those things. And I'm hoping that I'm hoping that you know you were touched. All right, we'll be right back for a second there. everybody for second hour um your host Zen garcia this is momentary zen here on revolution radio and so i thought i'd share with you a portion of a text called the martyrdom of bartholomew which is um one that is not very uh, very known it's little known about by the majority of the masses and it gives us an interesting perspective into the idols and the devils and the demons that were everywhere controlling and ruling over peoples especially in places like in the far east where they have all these temples set up with all these idols and the iconography of, you know, these kinds of hybrid pagan angelic beings. Because even though most of the world believes that the reality of these beings is, you know, that they never existed, the truth of the matter is that the fallen angels in 
interdicting themselves into the affairs of humanity and with by mating with the daughters of Cain and also genetically experimenting and engaging in direct bestiality with not only the pre-Adamic humans but that of modern humanity in later times that many different hybrid varieties of being came into place. And being hybrid, they were not able to propagate as a race their, you know, their bloodlines. Uh, but that certainly for a time, for that lifetime, they were able to run around in the world. And that things such as centaurs or um, the all kinds, of, like if you read the account of Barosis and the Antediluvian times, he speaks about how in the Temple of Belus, the fallen ones and specific Dogon, the fish god, how this fish god was able to manipulate and teach humanity not only various sciences and high technologies, but also to involve them in genetic corruption of the genome of humans, plants, animals, and to bring forth a number of monstrosities. And that Barossa's cites this manipulation, what the Book of Giants calls the miscegenation and corruption of you know, the genome of the world uh, for bringing forth these hybrid monstrosities. And that in the stories of mythology, we see the accounts of many different and wide varieties of hybrid beings. Even, for instance, um, Medusa-like Gorgonic half human, half serpentine beings that even a, a being called Cecrops, which was part human and part serpentine, said to have been the founder of Athens. And that even the Olympia, the mother of Alexander the Great, was said to have been um, seduced by one of these serpentine beings and impregnated with Alexander the Great. And so in the ancient times, we see a number of stories of the rape of human earth women and men. Like, for instance, Isis was said to have taken a lot of lovers. And even in the story of Odysseus, we have Calypso. And so these kinds of demagogic beings, they took, whether willingly or not, um, mortal beings as lovers and perpetuated you know, the whole race of heroes through them in ancient times. And even the Bible speaks about the sons of God mating with the daughters of humanity in creating a race of giants. And, you know, which is a whole weird, like you're reading Genesis and then all of a sudden you come to Genesis 6 and you have this in the first five verses of Genesis 6, 
this entirely weird statement as to this corruption taking place and and then there's not much more in the bible said about this account but yet when you read the book of enoch and other books of enoch you get a great elaboration as to those times and what occurred and it's important to understand these teachings because Christ said in the when the apostles asked him what would be the sign of your return and of the end of the age, he told them, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the second coming of the Son of Man. And in my opinion, all of that has to do with the hybridization, the miscegenation, the genetic manipulation and corruption of the genome of plants, animals, and humanity. <clears throat> and we see that kind of stuff taking place in such a degree and on such a large scale that, you know, unless the days be shortened, there should be no flesh left. And so... Um, before I go into the martyrdom of Bartholomew, I'm going to read really quickly a short text called The Account of Enoch the Prophet, which is a Greek text that was discovered in 2006 and which has not been widely shared with the masses, is little known about. But it is part of the stories that we include in our publication, The Works of Enoch the Prophet, The Collected Works of Enoch the Prophet. And you can find those at sacredwordpublishing.net. And so it says in this short account, Enoch was shown a vision of the coming deluge. The Lord said, My servant Enoch, you must warn the wicked generation that I tend to keep my promise. I will destroy every creation in the land, for they have corrupted all that I have made. Enoch asked, Who will survive, my Lord? God said, I have a chosen vessel that will carry on the pure seed of righteousness. You will be taken before this great destruction comes. Warn the infidels. Enoch went out to the multitude and said, Behold, the Lord is coming with 10,000 of his holy ones to meet out judgment to all those who are ungodly. You have sinned, a grievous sin, and forgotten the creator of the world. After he said this, the multitude took up arms to kill him. Suddenly a whirlwind came from heaven as a storm of fire. Within the whirlwind of fire were seraphim, dragons of the power of God. All who saw this became blind in that moment, for their eyes were burned from their sockets. Enoch was then taken up into the heavens and disappeared from the land. No one knew where he went. He could not be found, for God took him to an appointed place, even to a place of holy ground. In this place, Enoch wrote books about the history of his people from Adam until the time of his generation. At that time, God showed him a vision of the great Leviathan and Behemoth. These two beasts were stirring up the population in the end of days. Behemoth was a beast of liberty, and Leviathan was one of royalty and power. They began as one beast with a name called Phoenix. The phoenix died, and from the ashes arose these two great 
peace. But he must eventually become greater and cer uh, and dictated its laws to the whole earth. It attracted Ishmael continually, even when he did not deserve to be punished. Uh, sorry, it attacked Ishmael continually, even when he did not deserve to be punished. Then another beast came up. It awoke from a slumber. The beast was a dragon-like beast with ten horns, returning to reclaim its two severed heads. That is Leviathan and Behemoth. The two beasts fought for a while but gave in afterwards. Now the dragon-like beast was again whole, and it ruled the whole earth. It placed its seal upon the multitude until one like the Son of Man came and destroyed the beast. After this vision, Enoch was afraid and stricken with awe. It came to pass that Noah entered the ark and God fulfilled his will. All right, that's the, the shortness of it, but I just wanted to elaborate really quickly on, you know, the sons of God and how so many accounts speak of how Enoch was taken to be a witness against the injustice that they brought and the corruption that they fomented. And it says in First Enoch that even the earth cried a foul at the corruption of the watchers and the angels and the things that they did. All right, the martyrdom of Bartholomew. Historians declare that India is divided into three parts, and the first is said to end at Ethiopia, and the second at Medea, and the third completes the country, and the one portion of it ends in the dark, and the other in the ocean. To this India, then, the holy Bartholomew, the apostle of Christ, went and took up his quarters in the temple of Astaroth, and lived there as one of the pilgrims and the poor. In this temple then there was an idol called Astaroth, which was supposed to heal the infirm, but rather the more injured all. And the people were in entire ignorance of the true God, and from want of knowledge, but rather from the difficulty of going to any other, they all fled for refuse to the false god. And he brought upon them troubles, infirmities, damage, violence, and much affliction. And when anyone sacrificed to him, the demon retiring appeared to give a cure to the person in trouble. And the foolish people seeing this believed in him. But the demon retired not because they wished to cure men, but that they might the more assail them, and rather have them all together in their power, and thinking that they were cured bodily, those that sacrificed to them were the more diseased in soul. And it came to pass that while the holy apostle of Christ, Bartholomew, stayed there, Astaroth gave no response and was not able to cure. And when the temple was full of sick persons who sacrificed to him daily, Astaroth could give no response and sick persons who had come from far countries were lying there. When therefore in that temple not even one of the idols was able to give a response and was a benefit neither to those that sacrificed to them nor to those who were in the agonies of death. On their account, they were compelled to go to another city where there was a temple of idols, where their great and most eminent god was called Becher. And having their sacrifice, they demanded, asking why their god Astaroth had responded to them, had not responded to them. And the demon Becker answered and said to them, From the day and the hour that the true God 
who dwells in the heavens, sent his apostle Bartholomew into the regions here. Your God, Ashtaroth, is held fast by chains of fire and can no longer either speak or breathe. They said to him, And who is this Bartholomew? He answered, He is the friend of the Almighty God and has just come into these parts, that he may take away all the worship of the idols in the name of his God. And the servants of the Greeks said, Tell us what he is like that we may be able to find him. And the demon answered and said, He has black hair, a shaggy head, and fair skin, large eyes, beautiful nostrils, his ears hidden by the hair of his head, with a yellow beard, a few gray hairs, a middle height, and neither tall nor stunted, but middling, clothed with a white undercloak, bordered with purple, and upon his shoulders a very white cloak, and his clothes have been worn twenty-six years. But neither are they dirty, nor have they grown old. Seven times a day he bends the knee to the Lord, and seven times a night does he pray to God. His voice is like the sound of a strong trumpet. There go along with him angels of God, who allow him neither to be weary, nor to hunger, nor to thirst. His face and his soul and his heart are always glad, and rejoicing he foresees everything. He knows and speaks every tongue of every nation. And behold now, as soon as you ask me and I answer you about him, behold, he knows. For the angels of the Lord tell him, and if you wish to seek him, if he is willing, he will appear to you. But if he shall not be willing, you will not be able to find him. I entreat you, therefore, if you shall find him, entreat him not to come here, lest his angels do to me as they have done to my brother, the demon Ashtaroth. And when the demon had said this, he held his peace. And they returned and set to work to look into every face of the pilgrims and poor men. And for two days they could find him nowhere. And it came to pass that one who was a demoniac set to work to cry out, Apostle of the Lord, Bartholomew, your, praise, your prayers are burning me up. Then said the apostle to him, Hold your peace and come out of him. In that very hour, the man who had suffered from the demon for many years was set free. And Polymeus, the king of that country, happened to be standing opposite the apostle. And he had a daughter, a demoniac, that is to say, a lunatic. And he heard about the demoniac that had been healed and sent messengers to the apostle, saying, My daughter is grievously torn. I implore you, therefore, as you have delivered him, who suffered for many years, so also to do order my daughter to be set free. And the apostle rose and went with them, and he seized the king's daughter bound with chains, for she used to tear in pieces all her limbs, and if anyone came near her, she used to bite, and no one dared to come near her. The servants say, to him, and who is it that dares to touch her? The apostle answered them, Loose her and let her go. They say to him again, We have her in our power when she is bound with all our force, and do you bid us to loose her? The apostle says to them, Behold, I keep her enemy bound, and are you even now afraid of her? Go and loose her. And when she has partaken of food, let her rest, and early tomorrow bring her to me. And they went and did as the apostle had commanded them. And thereafter the demon was not able to come near her. And then the king loaded camels with gold and silver, precious stones, pearls and clothing, and sought to see the apostle. And having made many efforts and not found him, he brought everything back to his palace. And it happened when the night had passed, and the following day was dawning. The sun, having risen, 
The apostle appeared alone with the king in his bedchamber and said to him, Why did you seek me yesterday the whole day with gold and silver and precious stone, pearls and raiment? For these gifts those persons long for who seek earthly things. But I seek nothing earthly, nothing carnal. Wherefore I wish to teach you that the Son of God deigned to be born as a man out of a virgin's womb. He was conceived in the womb of the virgin. He took to himself her who was always a virgin, having within herself him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is therein is. He, born of a virgin, like mankind, took to himself a beginning in time. He who has a beginning, neither of times nor days, but he himself made every beginning and everything created, whether in things visible or invisible. And as this virgin did not know man, so she, preserving her virginity, vowed a vow to the Lord God, and she was the first who did so. For from the time that man existed from the beginning of the world, no woman made a vow of this mode of life, but she, as she was the first among women, who loved this in her heart, said, I offer to you, O Lord, my virginity. And as I have said to you, none of mankind dare to speak this word, but she being called for the salvation of many, observed this, that she might remain a virgin through the love of God, pure and undefiled. And suddenly, when she was shut up in her chamber, the archangel Gabriel appeared, gleaming like the sun, and when she was terrified at the sight, the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor in the sight of the Lord, and you shall conceive. And she cast off fear and stood up and said, How shall this be to me, since I know not man? The angel answered her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. Wherefore also that holy thing which is born of you shall be called Son of God. Thus, therefore, when the angel had departed from her, she escaped the temptation of the devil, who deceived the first man when at rest, for having tasted of the tree of disobedience. When the woman said to him, Eat, he ate. And thus the first man was cast out of paradise and banished to this life. From him have been born the whole human race. Then the Son of God, having been born of the Virgin, and having become perfect man, and having been baptized, and after his baptism, having taste, fasted forty days, the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves. And he answered, Not on bread alone shall man live, but by every word of God. Thus, therefore, the devil who through eating had conquered the first man was conquered through the fasting of the second man. And as he through want of self-restraint had conquered the first man, the son of the virgin earth, so we shall conquer through the fasting of the second man, the son of the virgin Mary. The king says to him, and how is it that you said just now that she was the first virgin of whom was born God and man? And the apostle answered, I gave thanks to the Lord that you hear me gladly. The first man then was called Adam. He was formed out of the earth. And the earth, his mother out of which he was, was virgin because it had neither been polluted by the blood of man nor opened for the burial of any one. The earth then was like the virgin, in order that he who conquered the son of the virgin earth might be conquered by the son of the virgin Mary. And behold, he did conquer for his wicked craft through the eating of the tree by which man being deceived came forth from paradise, kept paradise shut. Thereafter the son of the virgin conquered all the craft of the devil, and his craft was such that when he saw the son of the virgin fasting forty days, he knew in truth that he was the true God. 
The true God and man, therefore, has not given himself out to be known, except to those who are pure in heart and who serve him by good works. The devil himself, therefore, when he saw that after the forty days was again hungry, was deceived into thinking that he was not God, and said to him, Why have you been hungry? Tell these stones to become loaves, and eat. And the Lord answered, Listen, devil, although you may lord it over man, because he has not kept the commandment of God, I have fulfilled the righteousness of God in having fasted, and shall destroy your power, so that you shall no longer lord it over man. And when he saw himself conquered, he again took Jesus to an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, All these will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. The Lord said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And there was a third temptation for the Lord, for he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temptum and says, If you are the Son of God, cast yourself down. The Lord said to him, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And the devil disappeared. And he indeed, that once conquered Adam, the son of the virgin earth, was thrice conquered by Christ, the son of the virgin Mary. And when the Lord had conquered the tyrant, he sent his apostles into all the world that he might redeem his people from the deception of the devil. And one of these, I am an apostle of Christ. On this account, we seek not after gold and silver, but rather despise them, because we labor to be rich in that place where the kingdom of him alone endures forever. Where neither trouble nor grief nor groaning nor death nor has place, where there is eternal blessedness and ineffable joy, everlasting exultation and perpetual repose. Wherefore, also the demon sitting in your temple who makes responses to you is kept in chains through the angel of the Lord who has sent me. Because if you shall be baptized and wishes yourself to be enlightened, I will make you behold him and learn from how great evils you have all you have been redeemed. At the same time here also, but why me, but what means he injures all those who are lying sick in the temple. The devil himself by his own art causes the men to be sick and again to be healed in order that they may be the more believers in the idols and in order that he may have place the more in their souls, in order that they may say to those stock and the stone, you are our God. But the demon who dwells in the idol is held in subjection conquered by me and is able to give no response to those who sacrifices and pray there. And if you wish to prove that it is so, I order him to return to the idol, and I will make him confess with his own mouth that he is bound and able to give no response. The king said to him, Tomorrow at the first hour of the day, the priests are ready to sacrifice in the temple, and I shall come there and shall be able to see this wonderful work. And it came to pass the following day, as they were sacrificing, the devil began to cry out, Refrain, you wretched ones, from sacrificing to me, lest ye suffer worse for my sake, because I am bound in fiery chains and kept in subjection by an angel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whom the Jews crucified. For being afraid of him, they condemned him to death, and he put to death death himself, our king, and he bound our prince in chains of fire. And on the third day, having conquered death, and the devil rose in glory and gave the sign of the cross to his apostles and sent them out into the four quarters of the world. And one of them is here just now, who has bound me and keeps me in subjection. I implore you, therefore, supplicate him on my account, that he may set me free to go into other habitations. Then the apostle answered, Confess, unclean demon, who is it that has injured all those that are lying here from heavy diseases? The demon answered, 
the devil, our ruler, he who is bound. He sends us against men that having first injured their bodies, we may thus also make an assault upon their souls when they sacrifice to us. For then we have completed our power over them. When they believe in us and sacrifice to us, and when on account of the mischief done to them, we retire, we are pure curing them, and are worshipped by them as gods. But in truth we are demons, and the servants of him who was crucified, the Son of God. For from that day on which the Apostle Bartholomew came, I am punished, kept bound in chains of fire. And for this reason I speak, because he has commanded me. At the same time, I dare not utter more when the apostle was present. Neither I nor our rulers. The apostle said to him, Why do you not save all that have come to you? The demon said to him, When we injure their bodies unless we first injure their souls, we do not let their bodies go. The apostle said to him, And how do you injure their souls? The demon answered him, when they believe that we are gods and sacrifice to us, God withdraws from those who sacrifice, and we do not take away the suffering of their bodies, but retire into their souls. Then the apostle said to the apostle, said to the people, Behold, the God whom you thought to cure you does the more mischief to your souls and bodies. Here even now your maker who dwells, in the heavens, and do not believe in lifeless stones and stocks. And if you wish that I should pray for you, and that all these may receive health, take down this idol and break it into pieces. And when you have done this, I will sanctify this temple in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And having baptized all of you who are in it in the baptism of the Lord and sanctified you, I will save all. Then the king gave orders, and all the people brought ropes and crowbars, and were not at all able to take down the idol. Then the apostles said to them, Unfasten the ropes. And when they had unfastened them, he said to the demon dwelling in it, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, come out of this idol. Sorry. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, come out of this idol and go into a desert place where neither winged creature utters a cry nor voice of man has ever been heard. And straight away he arose at the word of the apostle and lifted up from its foundations. And in that same hour, all the idols that were in that place were broken to pieces. Then all cried out with one voice, saying, He alone is God Almighty, whom Bartholomew the Apostle proclaims. Then the holy Bartholomew, having spread forth his hands to heaven, said, God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, who for the salvation of men has sent forth your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in order that he might redeem by his own blood all of us enslaved by sin, and declare us to be your sons, that we may know you, the true God, that you exist always to eternity. God without end, one God, the Father, acknowledged in the Son and the Holy Spirit. One God, the Son, glorified in Father and Holy Spirit. One God, the Holy Spirit, worshipped in Father and Son, and acknowledged to be truly one. The Father unbegotten, the Son unbegotten, the Holy Spirit proceeding, and in you, the Father, and in the Holy Spirit, your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, is in whose name you have given us power to heal the sick, to cure paralytics, to expel demons, and raise the dead. For he said to us, Verily I say unto you, that whatever you shall ask in my name, you shall receive. I entreat then that in his name all this multitude may be saved, that all may know that you alone are God in heaven and in the earth and in the sea who seeks the salvation of men through that same Jesus Christ our Lord, 
with whom you live and reign in unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. And when all responded to the Amen, suddenly there appeared an angel of the Lord, shining brighter than the sun, winged and other four angels, holding up the four corners of the temple. And with his finger, the one sealed the temple and the people and said, Thus says the Lord who has sent me. As you have all been purified from all your infirmity, so also this temple shall be purified from all uncleanness and from the demons dwelling in it, whom the apostle of God has ordered to go into a desert place. For so has God commanded me, that I may manifest him to you. And when you behold him, fear nothing. But when I make the sign of the cross, so also do ye with your fingers seal your faces, and these evil things will flee from you. Then he showed them the demon who dwelt in the temple, like an Ethiopian, black as suit, his face sharp like a dog's thin cheek, with hair down to his feet, eyes like fire, sparks coming out of his mouth, and out of his nostrils came forth smoke like sulfur with wings spined like a porcupine, and his hands were bound with fiery chains, and he was firmly kept in. And the angel of the Lord said to him, And as also the apostle has commanded, I let you go where the voice of man is not heard, and be there until the great day of judgment. And when he let him go, he flew away groaning and weeping and disappeared. And the angel of the Lord went up into heaven in the sight of all, the king and also the queen with their two sons, and with all his people and with all the multitude of the city, and every city round about and country and whatever land his kingdom ruled over were saved and believed and were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the king laid aside his diadem and followed Bartholomew, the apostle of Christ, and after these things, the unbelievers of the Greek, having come together to Astrogees, the king, who was the elder brother of the king who had been baptized, said to him, O king, your brother Polymeus has become a disciple to a certain magician who has taken down our temples and broken our gods to pieces. And while they were thus speaking and weeping, Behold, again, there came also some others from the cities round about, both priests and people. And they set about weeping and making accusations before the king. Then King Astroges, in a rage, sent a thousand armed men along with those priests in order that wherever they should find the apostle, they might bring him to him bound. And when they had done so and found him and brought him, he said to them, Are you one? Are you the one who has perverted my brother from the gods? To whom the apostle answered, I have not perverted him, but have converted him to God. The king said to him, Are you he who caused our gods to be broken in pieces? The apostle said to him, I gave power to the demons who were in them, and they broke in pieces the dumb and senseless idols, that all men might believe in God Almighty who dwells in the heavens. The king says to him, As you have made my brother deny his gods and believe in your gods, so I also will make you reject your god and believe in my gods. The apostle said to him, If I have bound and kept in subjection the god which you, which your brother worshipped, and at my order the idols were broken in pieces, if you also are able to do the same to my god, you can persuade me also to sacrifice to your gods. But if you can do nothing to my God, I will break all your gods in pieces, but believe in my God. And when he had thus spoken, the king was informed that this God, Baldadad, and all the other idols had fallen down and were broken in pieces. Then the king rent the purple in which he was clothed and ordered the holy apostle Bartholomew to be beaten with rods. And after having been thus scourged to be beheaded. And innumerable multitudes came from all the cities to the number of 12,000 who had believed in him along with the king, and they took up the remains of the apostle 
with singing of praise and with all glory. And they laid him in the royal tomb and glorified God. And the king, Astroges, having heard of this, ordered him to be thrown into the sea, and his remains were carried into the island of Lipparis. And it came to pass on the thirteenth day after the apostle was carried away that the king, Astroges, was overpowered by a demon and miserably strangled, and all the priests were strangled by demons and perished on account of their rising against the apostle, and thus died by an evil fate. And there was great fear and trembling, and all came to the Lord and were baptized by the presbyters who had been ordained by the holy apostle Bartholomew. And according to the commandment of the apostle, all the clergy of the people made King Polymius bishop, and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ he received the grace of healing and began to do signs and remained in the bishop, bishopric twenty years. And having prospered in all things, and governed the church well, and guided it in right opinions. He fell asleep in peace, and went to the Lord, to whom be glory and strength forever and ever. Amen. So that was uh, the story of the martyrdom of Bartholomew. And, you know, I... I thought it was powerful because it shows to what degree the demons have influence over those that are involved and steeped in idolatry and have no idea as to their being influenced by these powers, these principalities, these rulers of darkness. And that even the Kings, um, controlling and ruling over these people and that forcing them or not even forcing, but leading them in the worship of these fallen ones. Cause they are their fathers, the devils. Um, they, you know, cause Cain, who was of that wicked one, it is said by Christ that, his bloodline that they were the killers of the apostles, those that assassinated all the prophets from Abel to Zacharias, who during the time of Christ was the father of John the Baptist. And that was murdered in the Holy of Holies by the seed of Cain and by Herod and his henchmen. And so we see that it is the same even today in this day and age that most are led astray and that the mainstream churches teaching not the truth that most have no idea as to there being two bloodlines, that there is a progeny of the devil, a physical seed, that Satan in Isaiah 14 is called the abominable branch, and his children are called the seed of, of evildoers, and that uh, just as Christ said, of the tares that the enemy snuck into the garden and sowed them and to let both grow together until the time of the end. And at the end, he would send the angels forth as reapers to gather the tares for burning and the wheat for preservation. This is where we are. This is what is going on right now. And the determination of whether you will be numbered with the elect, that is what is going on. That is what is happening. And every day you awake with new opportunity, new chance to prevail against the devil and the demons 
and to align yourself with Christ. And for those that for those that are antagonistic and opposed to Christianity and the faith and to that don't know Christ as Savior Messiah, I can only pray that you take the time to read the ancient manuscripts, especially the Great Commission, that if you did so, hopefully you would come to discernment, into recognition as to the truth that I know in my heart that Christ, the Son of God, is the only begotten of the Father, Yahuwah, Yahweh Elohim, and of the Mother, the Holy Spirit, Wisdom, Sophia, Shokma, and that they, there are three that bear witness in the heavens, and it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they three are one, and that they pre-existed before all of us, and it was they that created man in their image, male and female, he created them. And it is our inheritance to have salvation through Christ and to remember from whence we are fallen that we can be restored to our bright-natured angelic being and be restored to our first estate and allowed entrance again into paradise should we just come to know the truth and accept the grace of salvation extended to all of us through Yeshua as the way, the truth, and the light. I pray that all of you check out when you get time and chance the incredible stories that are part of the Great Commission series. As I said, they are a three volume set, a trilogy put together and released by sacredwordpublishing.net. In the second book, which is the one that I was reading from, you have the Gospel of Nicodemus, the Gospel of Bartholomew, the narrative of Joseph of Arimathea, the doctrine of Adai, the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, the Acts of Barnabas, the Acts of Bartholomew, the Acts of Martyrdom of St. Matthew the Apostle, the Vision of Paul, the Acts of Andrew and Matthias, the Acts of Peter and Andrew, the Consummation of Thomas the Apostle, the Book of Thomas the Contender, and the Gospel according to Peter. And all of these texts, dating back to the beginning of the church, to when the apostles were given the Great Commission to go forth. For those that don't know, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. And so that's what we're doing. That's what we have been commissioned to do. That is our role, to be servants unto each other. That Christ said, he who is greatest amongst you is he that is servant to your brother, a foot washer unto humanity. That we are to be servants to each other, to love even those that hate us.
those that seek to kill us, to murder us, that we should pray for them and forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so we've come to the end of the show, and I just want to thank all of you again for joining me and for taking the time to listen. You can find all of our books at www.sacredwordpublishing.net. We've got many new manuscripts coming out even now. I'm currently working on one of my daughter-in-law, Joy Garcia's releases, The Antiquities of Philo, which is going to be another plus Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message.